Welcome to You in HD, your identity in higher definition with Pastor Eric Miller. Join us in our journey of faith in God by taking an in-depth look into the Bible's authority and sufficiency to guide us in our Christian walk. Discover your identity in Jesus Christ today. Welcome to You in HD, your identity in higher definition with Pastor Eric Miller. Join us in our journey of faith in God by taking an in-depth look into the Bible's authority and sufficiency to guide us in our Christian walk. Discover your identity in Jesus Christ today. How you doing? This is Reverend Eric Miller. Uh, it's been a while. I've said something. Uh, you heard my voice to preach. Uh, it's been a while for me as well uh, on this other end. And uh, today I'm going to be dealing with, uh, and the topic is lengthy, uh, Christian depression. We first got to understand what it looks like, what it is, and how it happens. The most important part of this whole issue about Christian depression is the stigma that comes along with it by society standards and by Christian standards. It's a shame that we uh, that we as Christians we forget how easy it is to fall victim to depression. It's a natural state of humanity. It is part of what's broken inside of us. It is exactly uh, a, a repercussion from the fall. And it can, it can manifest itself in so many ways. So many, many, many ways. But a lot of Christians will deal with this depression in ways that it really doesn't address it. They'll try to look at it as a sin They'll try to look at it as it's impossible to have. So the reason I have it is because uh, maybe I've lost my faith is not strong enough in God. I mean, there's a lot of stigmas that come along with it. Not to mention what it's like to tell another Christian that you're depressed and how they look at you from knowing that. You know, we're supposed to deal gently with each other. But yet at times we will look at each other like, how can you be depressed? You have God that's in your life. God is doing so much good things in your life. Even in, in the amount of storms, God is still in your life. How do you how are you depressed? It doesn't make any sense. How? Pastors deal with depression more than anybody. Preachers deal with depression more than anybody. It's 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 part of the 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 field. It can, and it can manifest itself in a lot of ways. Our Bible speaks of it. We already know about Job and how his friends handled it. That's, just, that's something that they handled it incorrectly. They believed that Job must have sinned great against God when that wasn't the case. I didn't know how to make this episode. I had no idea how to basically speak to it because um, of how I'm dealing with it myself personally. It has been hard on me. It has almost paralyzed me in, in lieu of like what happened with my mother passing. And I know she's with God, but she was such an integral part of my life to the point of where everything that was happening was, I just wanted to be a good son to her. And her passing and how the family unit has shifted and how all of us is, is managing the best way we can in dealing with her loss, our loss of her not being with us anymore has changed a lot of aspects. For me, it has really altered a lot of my outlooks. And um, I'm just trying to speak from truth here. And then in the last few weeks, I've really started to take a look at what the toll has done on my health. And first of all, we got to really look at what depression is. What is depression? I did some research just looking to see what the what what the medical description of depression is. And here here's just some examples. Uh depression is a condition in which a person feels discouraged, sad, 
hopeless, unmotivated, or disinterested in life in general. When these feelings last for a sh- these what when these feelings last for a short period of time, it may cause quote unquote the blues. But when these such feelings last more than two weeks, and when the feelings interfere with daily activities such as taking care of family, spending time with friends, or going to work or school, is likely a major depressive episode. Major depression is treatable illness that affects the way, the way a person thinks, feels, behaves, and functions. Depression is one of the m- most common mental disorders in the United States. In 2014, around 15.7 million adults aged 18 or older in the U.S. had experienced at least one major depressive episode in a year, which represented 6.7% of all American adults. And that, that's huge, right? Out of, two out of every hundred children, eight out of hundred teens deal with serious depression symptoms. And this is from the NAMI.com website. It's pretty huge. Things that how depression changes a person. I mean, anybody listening today has probably been in depression. It may be depressed themselves or may have been going through it, maybe maybe going through it. So this is a refresher. But I just want to bring to light what it is. Change in sleep. Many people have trouble falling asleep, staying asleep or sleeping much longer than they used to. Waking up early in the morning is common for people with major depression. Changes in appetite, serious weight loss or weight gain, stop eating or use of food as a coping mechanism. Lack of concentration, focus under, is under severe depression. Even reading the newspaper or following the plot of a TV show can become difficult. Even making decisions, big or small. Loss of energy, people with depression may feel profoundly fatigued, think slowly or unable to perform normal daily functions. Lack of interest. They may have lost interest in their usual usual activities. The lost capacity of experience pleasure. A person may have no desire to eat or to function outside of the home or to do their their chores or do things. Even reading a Bible. Yes, you can become depressed to where you can't focus. And though the Holy Spirit is there, we, we, we we can fight against it. We can fight against him more than anything. Because that, that we're still in the flesh. The flesh is powerful. The flesh is strong. Don't think that it's not. You, 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 we got to start looking at these things. Look at what Jesus said in Matthew 26. Such an important part. Matthew 26, 41. Watch and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. It's true. I'm suffering with it right now. Me, a reverend who loves and adores the word of God, who follows after God like a child, just hungry for everything. Yet, even I have been struggling mightily to stay close to him. Not because of lack of love. Because of that weight that I feel on top of me that I just can't come out. And it's not easy. It's not easy to admit, but it's even more so, it's not easy to deal with. It's tough. The Brian Bub- Study Bible says, Watch and pray that you will not enter temptation, for the spirit is willing, but the body is weak. The body is weak. The body's weak, frail, falls into temptations, falls into the temptation to feel broken down and worn down. These things happen. They will happen. You can't avoid it. I've always wanted to tell the truth when it comes to what it is to be a Christian and a disciple of Jesus Christ. Not to become a disciple of a church tradition or religion. But what is it to be a Christian? I've always wanted to make sure that I, I blew away the, 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 the fact, the, the fictions from the facts. I always wanted to, to, to blow away the superstitions and, the, and, and the, what, you, what, what people have think and thought about what a Christian is and put the truth on it. For many of us, walking and smiling in each other's face every day doesn't actually speak to the truth of what's happening inside their hearts. 
many, many, many of us are hurt beyond measure. But we're used to saying things like, someone asks you, how are you doing? Your response is, I'm good, I'm good, God is good, and I'm blessed. But on the inside, you feel far from those things. That's just a fact that people don't want to talk about, but I'm going to talk about it. We're going to discuss the facts of a situation versus the idea of a situation. Talking about depression is not easy because, like I said, it makes people look at you different. They, the, 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 from the pity to the feeling sorry for you, there's, what's wrong? What's so broken about her? When the truth is, there are legitimate things that happen to people. You can get worn down. That is not a problem. That's just part of being a broken, fallen human being. I'm sorry. The sun may be up, but it may not feel like it's shining on you today. And you know what? That's part of how you deal with it. That's part of how we have to understand it. Rather than trying to run from a problem, we need to understand that the problem exists. It exists. This exists. This is real things that are happening. I am living proof this is really happening to me. Sleeping long, lack of interest in things, lack of having... There's times I've had no strength to get up. But by the grace of God and asking upon Jesus' name, I'm able to get up. But the depression can be so heavy. Then the question goes, well, if you believe in God, how can it be that way? Look at Job. There's no other explanation more than, more than Job is how heavy he felt these things are. Let's keep looking. Low self-esteem. During periods of depression, people will dwell on losses and failures and feel excessive guilt and helplessness. Thoughts like I'm a loser or the world is a terrible place. I don't want to be alive can take over. I have experienced these things personally. Hopelessness. Depression can make a person feel that nothing good will ever happen to them. Suicidal thoughts often follow these kinds of negative thoughts and need to be taken seriously. People have really truly told me these things. Now, I've never felt in a sense to take my life, but I have felt that the life that I had felt worthless to me. Like I just wasn't any good to anybody, including and especially to God. Hopelessness is severe. And the world deals with hopelessness with a band-aid. It's literally putting a band-aid on a gunshot wound by using the very things that in the tools that it has always used in dealing with suffering. Coping mechanisms. Coping mechanisms. It's easy to fall victim to these things. And don't believe the hype that you can't. You too may fall victim to this. And and it will come. We will feel. We're going to feel. It will happen. It's going to happen to you. Depression. Do you understand that? It's going to happen. It will hit us. It will swamp us. So what? how does the world deal with depression? Well, they medicate it. Not saying that's wrong, but let's throw some medicine at it. Let's, let's prescribe some medicine and get them just, have the body just alter itself so that way it's no longer there. That's a solution. But it doesn't deal with the root. It just deals with the symptom. It's, it's fixing the symptom, but not the problem. It's kind of like when dealing with a cold. You know, you can take some NyQuil. It's dealing with killing the symptoms. The cold's still there, but it's more tolerable. And I get it. That can seem good on the surface. It can seem balanced and well-doing. And now Christian doctors who will prescribe, because guess what? That is a real thing. You shouldn't run away from medicine. You shouldn't run away from trying to take things that to help fix the body's natural functions. If the body's broken down, you are a fallen, broken man. Things need to be done. If you have high blood pressure, go listen to the hype. Get yourself some help. But the root issue in anything needs, still needs to be addressed. It still needs to be addressed. 
So how are we going to do it? How are we going to address it? So this is how the world also deals with it. So what do we know? For the world desires of the flesh, desires of the eyes, and the pride in possessions. That's what we know. That comes from 1 John 2, 2, 16. We know that. Buy more stuff. Order some things. Buy some stuff. Put some stuff in your hand. Put some stuff in your stomach. Feed the flesh. Feed your mind with things. I have, I, you know, I'm going to go out shop and buy myself a new dress. Some new pants. A new gizmo to do something so I can have something new to look forward to. Putting a band-aid on a gunshot wound. That's all that is. Desires of the flesh, desires of the eyes, and the pride of possession. Some people will turn to, to resort to sex. They start falling apart. The, the depression starts to hit them, and they start thinking outside the marriage. They start thinking of adultery. It happens. I'm not condoning it. I'm telling you these things are real. And we can't put our heads under the bed and act like these things aren't happening. And then when they happen, we look so shocked. Because we're not dealing with the root problem. We're dealing with the symptoms. And sin can look and appear to cover up those symptoms. Yes, it can look like that. It can taste good on a hot day. On oh, sorry, sorry, when you're hungry. It can be refreshing. When you need relief, and it can be right on time when you're late, when something is coming late. But as with all things with sin, it costs more than you have, it keeps you longer than you want to stay, and it takes you places that you really wanted to go, but now you're gone way too far to where you don't know how to get back. The cost is way too high, but being short sighted individuals, which the world has conditioned us to be, we don't look for the future. That's why when you're speaking and evangelizing about Christ, it's so difficult. Why? Because they're only thinking of today. They think about their eternal life. And there is eternal life. I had a conversation with a young man, even in a depressed state. I had a conversation with a young man, a Jehovah Witness. He's studying to become a Jehovah Witness. Man loves Christ. Man believes in Christ. But studying to become a Jehovah Witness. How do you study to become something that you're supposed to be, and you're supposed to be, you supposed, you're supposed to be. Had a long conversation with him. No, there's no hell. There's no consequences. You can just, you just go to sleep and wake up. Some of those that don't accept God just stay sleeping. I mean, but guess what? When you're desperate looking for answers, when you're desperate looking for answers, you start reaching in places. That satisfies the flesh. And a lot of religion will do that. Again, I'm not trying to beat up religion. If you're a Baptist, you're a Methodist, that's fine. I get it. But we can start looking for external things to solve things, to try to solve something that only God can really solve. Let's be honest about this. The only person that is adept at dealing with the conditions of fallen man is Christ and Christ alone. It's the only one. He is it. God eternal. God is the only one that can deal with man. He made man. Man has fallen. God has created a salvation plan in Christ. And from that point forward, Christ has been working hard in you and still working hard in you. Even in your depressive state, Christ is still working hard in you. Even in your state of where you're broken, Christ is still working hard in you. He's working hard in me. Even when we're feeling hopelessness, Christ is still working hard in us. Even when we have changes in sleep habits, Christ is still with us. Even when we have changes in appetite, Christ is still with us. Even when we start lack of concentration, Christ is still with us. When we have a loss of energy, Christ is our strength. When we have lack of interest, Christ still calls to us. When we have a low self-esteem of looking at ourselves, Christ reminds of who we are. When we have hopelessness, he reminds us that we can now have a hope. When we have changes in movement, when depression starts to make you feel physically depleted, we are reminded by Christ that he strengthens the body. When we have physical aches and pains and emotions that are hurting, Christ reminds us that he can solve and heal and get your mind in the right place to where these things don't handicap us. Now, I would be a fool if I tell you that even everything that I just said, that, that depression hasn't hit. 
But that has given me the glimmer of hope that got me back to preaching today. My father called me today with great concern in his heart for what was going on with me. And he has the right to do that. I mean, I, I, I am just in some bad shape, you know. I, I'm not going to lie to you. I've been, I, I prided myself, I, and I hate to use that word, pride of myself, but, you know, I want to stylize myself to always want to tell you guys what's really going on. It's much better to tell you the truth than me sit here and try to get on this this podcast and tell you some crazy lie about, you know, I got this figured out and I'm just going to go down this road and, you know, I never have these problems. But I do. And I just want you guys to know that I'm as real as you can get. Excuse me, I'm trying to fix this thing. I'm about as real as it gets. I'm going to tell you what I have. I have real problems. I suffer real issues. I have real problems going on in my life. I'm not going to sit up here and tell you that they do not affect me. I'm not going to sit up here and tell you that they don't cause me to struggle. I wouldn't be truthful to you. And if I'm going to constantly be truthful to you, I've got to be truthful to myself. When I fail and fall down and fall short, I have to understand that those are part of who I am. It just means I've been relying on myself too much. I got ahead of myself by going ahead of what Christ has for me. When you start walking ahead of what God's plan is, it's inevitable for you to fall down and start stumbling because there's no light up there. You cannot go faster than God. You got to go at the same pace with God. There is no other way to do this. There's no shortcuts. It's a process. It takes time. Things I got to learn about. Still, as I grow as a Christian, I'm still a child. We will never grow to be an adult in Christ. We're going to be children. For you have just listened to You in HD, your identity in Jesus Christ with Pastor Eric Miller. This ministry is made possible by your thoughtful prayers and donations. Join us each week as we continue to explore our Christian identity in Jesus Christ. May God richly bless you. In Jesus' name, amen. For the rest of our days until it's time to come home. A home we've never seen, but our spirit's grown for it because it has tasted the full completion of salvation. It's our souls that need to be understood and convinced. That's why we struggle and stumble in this world so much. The spirit knows what the truth is, but our souls need to be constantly convinced. How else do we get to such famous passages as Romans, Romans 12? How do we get to these famous passages? If not, we have to remind ourselves that we too still fall short. We're not there. The Spirit's there, but we're not. Romans 12, 1, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, be by the mercies of God to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but he, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern that the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. We got to understand that. Every day, this is an everyday process. Every minute, every second, every, every time you fall down, every time you, you go to that, that, that lunch meeting, every time you go to a meeting, every time you come home and get in your car, talk to your kids, talk to yourself, lay down and wake up. You got to remind yourself, I got to keep reminding myself that I am a child of God and God has not forsaken us. God has never forsaken us. If God forsaken us, there'd be no no need for Christ. The fact that Christ exists and came to us and is there for those who legitimately cry for help shows that God has not forsaken this world. Though the world may be falling apart, the people in it can still be saved. Why else do we have the gospel? Why else do we have the gospel? If there was no, if, if, if there wasn't hope for those people like me, people like you, people that are listening today, for those who don't have hope that cling to this world for every bit of whatever they think can look like hope, but it's not hope what the world supplies. It's distraction. The world can only dis- can prescribe distraction. It can only give you medicines to cover up symptoms, but the root problem of man never goes away by because the, the world can't address it. There's nothing made by human hands 
that can solve the problem of the human condition. Not science, not medicine, not psychology. It is simply Jesus Christ, God, the Holy Spirit, the divine God. He is only, the only one who can and has addressed the human condition and has a plan and the plan has been put forth. The plan works. The plan has succeeded. And we have to believe in it. Depression can rob people and and attack them at that belief system. It can attack them hard. Don't think that doubt is alien to anybody. Don't think that that doesn't happen. It happens. It happens a lot more than people think. They want to talk about when that that Christians don't get depressed. And if we get depressed, it must be a problem with the Christian's belief system. Maybe his faith isn't good. Maybe something happened to him to where he's not thinking clearly. Maybe it's his faith that's in question. And maybe it's not anything else but that. That doesn't make any sense, does it? But it does to those who want to sit there and point fingers. And that happens. It happens. And the worst part about it is, is, is that we feed it. Even unknowingly, we help feed those issues. It happens. And it's dangerous. It's very dangerous. I want you I want you to hear what happens when doubt soils itself and how Christ responds to doubt. Let's go to Luke chapter 7. And we're going to take a look at that. Let's go to Luke chapter 7. And we go we go address this. This is John now. Now we all know that John was there in the beginning. He bad he was there. He was preaching repentance. He was preaching that the lamb is coming. He was the forerunner. He was the one that made the past made straight for Christ to come. No question about those things. These things that have come to be, they are what they are, and that's what it is, right? We all agree with that. So John said, this is let's go to verse 18. The disciples of John reported all these things to him, and John, calling two of his disciples to him, sent them to the Lord, saying, Are you the one who is to come, or shall we look for another? Now we got to look at that on its surface and kind of get it and say, okay, what, what's going on here? Was this not the same John that, <laughs> let's not, let's not, let's not, let's not, let's not gloss it. Let's look at it. Okay, let's look at it. So, because, you know, it wouldn't be, it wouldn't be fun if I just tell you about it. Let's read it for ourselves. Much better read it for ourselves than to sit there and assume and think um, all these crazy things. So here we go, Matthew 3. So when we see these things, we see John talking about it. Okay, if you just go to John, let's go to Matthew chapter 3, chapter 3, verse 2. Repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. This is John the Baptist preaching. For this is he who is spoken of by the prophet Isaiah when he said the voice of, of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord, make his path straight. All right, we got that. We understand that. John says in verse 7, but when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming for the baptism, he said to them, you brood of vipers who warned you to flee from the wrath to come, bear fruit in keeping with repentance. And do not presume to say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father, for I tell you, God is able from these stones to raise up children for Abraham. Verse 13, and Jesus came from Galilee to Jordan to John to be baptized by him. John would have would have prevented him saying, I need to be baptized by you. And do you come to me? But Jesus answered him, let it be. So now for thus it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. Then he consented. And when John, when Jesus was baptized, immediately he went up from the water. And behold, the heavens were opened up to him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and come to rest on him. And behold, a voice from heaven said, This is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. John was aware who Christ was and is. It wasn't a shock to him when he saw this. It wasn't a surprise. It happened. This is who he was. 
He saw it. He knew who it was. So this can't be a total shock to John for him to send his disciples and say, what do you, is this the Christ? Is this the Christ that is to come? Is this the Christ that is to come? It couldn't have, it couldn't, it couldn't have been a shock to him. You know what I'm saying? This could not be some surprise to John. He was there when it happened. John says in Luke chapter three, John answered him, saying, I baptize you with water, but he who is mightier than, than I is coming. The strap of whose sandals I am not worthy to untie, he'll baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. Again, he's saying these things. He knows. He knows who it is. But yet we get to verse 7, we go to chapter 7, and we see verse 20, where he sent his disciples, John sent his disciples, to say, are you the one to come? And shall we look for, or should we look for another? Even John, when he was imprisoned, was starting to have some questions. Was depression setting in? I don't know. But maybe he felt abandoned. Maybe he felt like maybe this was, did I do the right thing? Did, did I follow in the footsteps as I was supposed to? Look what Jesus did. Look at the look at the beautifulness. In that hour, he this is Jesus Christ. In that hour, he healed many people of diseases, plagues, and evil spirits. And many who were blind, he bestowed sight. And he answered them, Go and tell John what you have seen and heard. The blind receive their sight, the lame walk, lepers are cleansed, and the deaf hear, and the dead are raised up, and the poor have good news preached to them. And blessed is the one who is not offended by me. When John's messengers had gone, Jesus began to speak to the crowds concerning John. What did you get out of into the wilderness to see? A reed shaken by the wind? When did you go out to see a man dressed in soft clothing? Behold, those who are dressed in splendid clothing and live in luxury are in king's courts. What then did you go see? A prophet? Yes, I tell you, and more than a prophet. This is he of whom it is written, Behold, I send my messenger before your face, who prepare your way before you. I tell you, among those born of women, none is greater than John. Yet the one who is least in the kingdom is greater than he. Just amazing that, that Christ not only uplifted John, he confirmed it through John's disciples. Then he went on to tell people, do you see the truth and honesty of John? One gave John some praise, showed people that this is what a man of God looks like. A man that did and is doing the work of God, even when he was inside that jail cell. That even though before when he did the baptism. Even though when he did the things that were called upon him from the prophet Isaiah, when he fulfilled God's plan, even John had fell victim to some doubt, but he was not forsaken by God. He was not forsaken by Christ. He was not only encouraged and uplifted, Christ was there for him in his time of need. Much as I have to remind myself and much that I want to remind you, Christ has not left us. We have not reached so much hopelessness that Christ cannot pick us up. There are messengers sent constantly out to remind God's children that you are not forgotten about. You have not been forsaken. You've not been pushed aside. You've not been laid to, to no such so God can take care of more important matters than you. You are still vitally important to God. You are one of God's children. You're in his house. He is not a man who can forget who his children are. He is fully cognizant and aware of you at all times. And he makes himself known to you. But we have to open ourselves to him by doing the things that are consistent with hearing and feeling our father wanting to shower us with this knowledge and truth. So we have to ask ourselves, well, Eric, well, how, well, how does God do that? How does God do that? John verse 14, verse 16. And I will ask the father and he will give you another helper, a comforter, an advocate, an intercessor, a counselor, a strengthener, and stand by to be with you forever. The Holy Spirit, God's will incarnate. And let's not just 
gloss past those words. Let's go into the dictionary and look at these words. You know I love looking at words. It's, it's important. I think it's important that we define it so we can really get to the meat of a situation. So in this passage in the Amplified Bible, he is a, with the Holy Spirit is described in a number of, a number of words. Okay? First word here is a helper, a noun, a person who helps someone else, a person who helps someone else. Pretty simple. A comforter. Now and again, a person that provides consolation. Comfort received by a person after a loss or a disappointment. A person or that's providing comfort to a person who has suffered. Isn't that amazing? I love that word, comfort. A comforter, an advocate. Here's another great word, an advocate. A person who publicly supports and recommends a particular cause or policy or person. A person who pleads on someone else's behalf. I love that, an advocate. Someone who publicly defends and advocates for you, supports you. The word support. To bear all part of the weight. To hold up. To produce, to endure, to give assistance, to provide for, to suggest for, to give approval of, to be actively interested in and involved in. Love that, the advocate. The Holy Spirit is all those things. He's involved with us. He supports us. He gives to us. He holds us up. He bears the weight for us. He stands with us. Intercessor. You hear that a lot? I need to end. Prayer intercessory, a person who intervenes on the behalf of another, especially by prayer. Intervene, come between, so that as to prevent an alter, a result, or course of events. To interrupt, to interpose, and, 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 and delay something from coming. To place an obstacle in front of, so something does not hit you. I love that description of the Holy Spirit. All of them, but look at that. To come between to prevent a result that might have seemed inevitable. That's powerful. That is powerful. Can't get past that one. A counselor. A counselor. A person trained to give guidance, personal, social, or psychological problems. I like that. A person who supervises. A person who looks after and advises with good and great wisdom to give guidance, advice, information aimed at resolving a problem or difficulty, especially as given to someone in authority. A directing of motion or position of something to guide and to help and to push forward in a manner to solve an existing concern. I like that in the Holy Spirit too. He does that for us, doesn't he? A strengthener. To make stronger. To strengthen, enable, or encourage a person to act more vigorously or effectively. A strengthener. We cannot, cannot forget about that. And the last word, standby. That may seem simple. Readiness for duty and immediate deployment. A state of waiting to secure an or to reserve a place for a journey. A person waiting to secure a place on standby. A person or thing that is ready to be deployed immediately if needed as a backup or an emergency or just ready for operation. I love that about the Holy Spirit too. So that means even in our depressive state. Even in all the states that we are, from everything that I've read to you of what is clinically decided upon to be what depression is, and I'm sure y'all can agree with this, can you imagine the Holy Spirit is there as a helper, a comforter, an advocate, an intercessor, a counselor, a strengthener, and more importantly, he's at the ready. I forgot that. He's at the ready to defend and to deploy to help you, help me, help us. Move forward in our depression. And more importantly than that, a counselor. Someone who's digging deep 
into what the root of the problem is and let's address it. Someone who's advocating when you're sitting there trying to, when he's up there healing you and getting you prepared for and getting you to understand what the root issue is, he's still advocate. He's still basically and, and, and spiritually as well as publicly speaking on your behalf that this person is worth having in the situation that you're going to be calling for. An intercessor in the sense of always being there to intervene at the worst of times when we can't do it for ourselves. He's constantly intervening on our behalf. He's strengthening our resolve in the face of this root issue. He's strengthening us to be able to walk together with Christ, walk into God's purpose with this ability that we've been given. Let's not forget we are in a fragile state a precious treasure in a clay jar. The body may be frail, but the spirit is willing. But we have a Holy Spirit that can make sure that we don't break. And we have a potter in Christ that's constantly molding us, shaping us, and preparing us for every good work. We can forget in our depression that hope has never left us. But we have a Holy Spirit that God has given us by the pleading of Christ. It wasn't no, it, and it wasn't a thing to hand us the the, the, the Holy Spirit because he we he begged God because God didn't want to give it to us. That's not what I'm saying. He gave us the Holy Spirit so that we have a promise built into us that God is who He says He is and will do what He says He will do. That confirmation that lives within us, that has created our body into a temple, we got to remind ourselves of daily. He will do it through our conscience. He will drive us and motivate us to go to his word. Like, I, like I've been motivated to come speak after so many a, a time in darkness. While I've gone dark and said nothing to you, who's been supporting me even in my absence. Praying for me even in my absence. Even though I'm not out of the darkness, I see a light. I see you guys still participating. I see you guys still listening. I see you guys still praying. And I realize that if you can go forward, I can go forward because you have carried me through your prayers and your consistency. I pray that this message reaches you who may be going through a depression, who may be going through adverse circumstances that are outright out. I mean, it's outmaneuvered you. It's weighed you down and hindered you from moving forward. I pray this message reaches you as much as it's touched me to talk about it. To talk about this truth. Now let's, let's, then we talked about what depression is by society standards. We talked about what it looks like from a spiritual standpoint. We talked about the stigma that comes along with depression. But now we got to talk about what can uplift us. We got to talk about what that can uplift us. We got to talk about what is the combat things that we can get to to do these things. You have just listened to You and HD, your identity in Jesus Christ with Pastor Eric Miller. This ministry is made possible by your thoughtful prayers and donations. Join us each week as we continue to explore our Christian identity in Jesus Christ. May God richly bless you. In Jesus' name, amen. You have just listened to You in HD, your identity in Jesus Christ with Pastor Eric Miller. This ministry is made possible by your thoughtful prayers and donations. Join us each week as we continue to explore our Christian identity in Jesus Christ. May God richly bless you. In Jesus' name, amen. Welcome to You in HD, your identity in higher definition with Pastor Eric Miller. Join us in our journey of faith in God by taking an in-depth look into the Bible's authority and sufficiency to guide us in our Christian walk. Discover your identity in Jesus Christ today. So, how do we combat it? How do we combat depression? How do we combat a situation 
that's happening. So I found something on Focus of the Family I want to read to you. Um, and basically, here, here's a, and I did mention it earlier. Is depression a sin? Now, the Focus of the Family answered in a way that I agree with. I can agree with this 100%. This particular question, this is written by Focus from Family.com, Focus on the Family.com. This particular question is posed to me by more people that perhaps that any other that's trying to understand what it is to go through emotional, uh, going on emotional, emotionally with themselves or with someone else that they know. The situation isn't helped by well-meaning Christians who don't understand depression, say, who depression by saying things like, you just need to have more faith. We talked about that. Or they must have sin in their life. Or you wouldn't feel like this. Or even if you pray harder, read the Bible more and have a deeper walk with Christ, you wouldn't have this problem of depression. To someone who already feels guilty about everything, this just piles on even more guilt. Yes, I have been guilty of saying that to someone. I have been guilty of saying that to someone. I have been guilty of saying that to someone. And I harmed them greatly. And I had to go back and do some repair work. Man, I was under heavy conviction for that a few years ago. I was still living in Colorado when I had said that to someone who confided in me about the pain that was going on in their life. And I said, no same responses. So I can attest that that is truthful. People have said that to me even in the last few weeks. So let's finish reading what the Focus on the Family says. For Focus, Focus on the family .com. He says, but are they right? Is depression, or sin, is depression a sin or is it a picture of sin in our life? The answer is unequivocally no. That's facts. Depression can, in many circumstances, have a physical cause. So can alcoholism and several other things spoken against in the Bible. Follow me closely. The tendency toward depression or alcoholism is not a sin. Given in to them, however, is a sin. See the difference? You see how that kind of poses a truth behind that? The person that has a tendency toward depression isn't at fault if his or her emotions become a downward spiral. However, he or she responds to that downward spiral will determine if there is a sin. Remember, we just talked about that earlier. It's one thing to feel the depression itself. It's another thing to start acting in a course to try to remedy that sin, remedy that depression by committing a sin. That's totally different now. Now we're crossing into, uh-oh, the uh-oh uh, territory now. That's what happens. That's where we see our brothers and sisters when they fall into transgression of that note because they have fallen into depression. They have fallen into those issues. Do we know that they committed a sin? So we got to start digging. And we'll know because they'll reveal it to us if we have a good relationship with them. They're going to talk about it with us. So that's pretty easy to, 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 to kind of understand a little bit better, I hope. Well, it may not be easy, but we got to come to terms with it. Let me, I, I, I misspoke. It's not easy, but we got to definitely talk about it. So let's talk about it. So above, it, 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 he also says, but above anything else, there's some things we can do. Above anything, I make sure I'm still reading my Bible and praying. Depression often makes you want to do the just opposite. I just admit to you, that's me. But there's nothing greater to overcome depression and destruction and things that's making you fall apart than by the word of God. Let's go ahead and read verse Timothy. I mean, sorry, uh, read 2 Timothy, verse 3, 16. Ver 2 Timothy, verse 3, 16. If you got your Bible out, then we go go for it. If you got your computer, whatever means that you got to listen to God's word, you use it. I hear people tell me, well, I don't use it. You know, it shows better if you got your Bible out. If you got a tablet, get to your tablet. I just hope that you you have a Bible physically in front of you. Just in case the battery goes out, you'll be able to read the Bible without any kind of help from, from, from having to plug it in. So here we go, verse 16, ready to read. All scripture is inspired by God and is profitable for teaching, for rebuking, for correcting, for training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. Isn't that beautiful? That's how we fight against the, the pits of depression. Staying with God's word. Staying in God's word. I could forget about that too. And you may not want to do it. It may be, be hard on you because you feel guilty because you're in that depression. And that's nothing but the devil. That's nothing but the devil at that point that has, has, that, that has motivated his agents. Demons. 
Or it's the guilt that lies in you because you know you hear the Holy Spirit telling you, please get to your Bible. Don't get so far away and you're actively going against him. I have been going through that. So let's take a look. We know that these things, verse 50, uh, 2 Timothy verse, uh, chapter 2, verse 15, be diligent to present yourself approved to God. A worker who doesn't need to be ashamed, correctly teaching the word of truth. The word of truth. Isn't that beautiful? So two times, and you heard me say this in many sermons, God is telling us, stay focused in his word. It can restore a man. It can do things with a man that is beyond measure. And I, I cannot... I cannot stress this more than anything else. I can't stress this more than anything else. Do we not understand the importance of what God and his word can do? The restoration. Let's look at what the the Amplified says about 2 Timothy 3.16. All scripture is God-breathed, given by divine inspiration, and profitable for instruction for conviction of sin, for the correction of error and restoration to be obedience, for training in righteousness, learning to live in conformity to God's will, both publicly and privately, behaving honorably with personal integrity and moral courage. Look in between them lines. Restoration. You know I got my Bible near I mean my my, my dictionary nearby because we're gonna look at restoration. Love this word. The act of returning something to a former owner or place or condition. The process of repairing, renovating, or working something back to its restorative original condition. Isn't that a beautiful thing? Isn't that a beautiful thing to restore? So Christ is so in Christ the Word of God is what 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 what, what Paul is saying is the Word of God is good at returning you. To a, to, to a condition and function and form to the day that you were saved. Always returning you back to that state when you was in worship with God and fellowship with God and on God's plan. The Word of God will continually do this, continually, but we got to stay with it. We got to stay with it. Focus on the Family's article is really good. I love this article. It, it, it really hit me in, in, in some great ways. So, we see that. that that's, that's one solution that we have that can help us get, get back in times. So, as he wrote this, you have the power in Christ to do what God wills. Say no to your emotions and yes to communion with God during these times. So, let's say that together. Say yes to God. Let's but let's all say yes to God and reconnect ourselves to His Word. You use your own words, but let's 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 say it with me. I commune myself. I want to continue my fellowship with God. You can add your name in the front of that if you like. You can do anything you that that, that helps get you to understand and swallow this fact and this beautiful truth. I want communion with you, God, again. Say it with me. I want communion. I want fellowship with you, God, during these times of trouble. I choose you. Help me, Lord. That's it. That, that, that We're on the road right now. We're making some progress. So watch this. Here's the part that we know about depression that people don't want to really address when they're in a depressed state, but we got to start looking at it this way. We got to start understanding how our minds work and understand how God's mind works. What we're going through presently, God has already seen the past of it. So, literally, we're dealing with something that is present in us, but is already past tense with God. So, we got to start thanking Him in advance for pulling us out of this depressive state. It may not seem like it right now. And I'm not trying to tell you to ignore it. I'm not telling you some, some you know, get you know get well and health kind of concept where you say, I'm grinding, I'm, I'm great, and snap some fingers and you're fine. No, no, it's not what I'm saying. I'm saying thank God for the fact that you are now and you know he's going to turn the corner for you. He's going to take you by the hand and take you around the corner. 
So we got to be thankful for when this day comes. Maybe this sermon that you're hearing today, maybe this episode you're hearing today is the turning of the corner. Maybe tomorrow it'll be better. Something, anything tomorrow could be something better. But if it got you to go back to your Bible, then God is doing some work, and we gotta be thankful for that. Be thankful that I that 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 He sent my Father to. I'm thankful that God has sent my Father to me to uplift me. I'm thankful that the people who love me and keep me cherished in their life, that He's praying for me, have never given up on me. My brother Brooke, my 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 closest friend Michelle and Dana, they just they've always been close to me and looking out for me. My cousin Tammy, my father. More and, and most importantly, not to forget how Christ has never stopped telling me to keep fighting. I hear my mother, he, when my mother was passing, she obviously had told my father something because the way he said the phrase he told me today is only my mother's words. Son, keep fighting. My mother used to tell me that. Never give up. Fight back. This is not, it's not the end. Fight back. I remember she grabbed my face one day, put both of her, put both of her her hands on my cheeks, held my head in place and told me, fight back. My mother wasn't a perfect person, but none of us are, but she was an evangelist. She never stopped evangelizing me when I've been in this home. And having her quiet confidence that is a loss to me. But this is why she lived. To go to heaven. This is why I live. To go to heaven. This is what my pastor did. So he could go to heaven. This is the life that we chose. To evangelize and move on when it's time for us to go. And we can feel loss and sadness for the loved one. But we can't forget the fact that this is why they lived. They lived to have this life with God. And they lived to give us this life with God. There's no doubt in my mind that all those that my mother has touched and evangelized to, she has changed. There's no doubt in my mind. And I just want to continue honoring that. Showing her that we love her. And I want to show you who she is by me living by how the fact that she's given me Christ. She's given me the, 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 the gospels. So I too can make an informed decision. If Christ had chosen me. If God has chosen me to be saved. Which he did. Which I'm no doubt that he has reached out to those listening today. And if you are not saved and you're hearing this message. The door has been knocking. Christ knocks on doors. Because God has sent you to him. That's why he's at your door knocking. It's not a happenstance that you're here listening. There's no, there's no, oh, I believe in coincidence. There's no coincidences with God. All paths. When you're, when you're leading to him, when it's time for you to have a conversation with God, that path was, is inevitable. Everybody's going to do, they're going to come down that road to meet with God. You're going to meet Christ. And you have to make a decision. Yes or no, left or right, heaven or hell. Everybody's got to make that decision. Nobody is going to get out of it. Nobody. When you're passing on in death, you have to answer that question. It's going to happen. Let's continue. So, God's word, not my present emotional outlook, is my authority. That's important to look at. That's the second healing point to look at. God's word is not my pres- my present emotional outlook. That's true. God's word elevates man. It restores us. It gives us life. It feeds us when we're hungry the most for truth and and life. The word of God is life giving. It is li- the truest element of life and light given to us who are hungry this is from focus on the family still and thanking God for bringing me through the depression I'm also exercising my faith in God and in his word precisely at the moment I don't feel like doing it once again 
I'm thankful folks on the family just send this this message that, that's on their website, but I want to read it to you so you can get what I gained from it. That God's word is sufficient. There is no external something other than God's word. There's nothing else that can, can, that can fix our human condition other than God's word. There's nothing. I thank God for taking care of me and loving me even when I can't feel it or see it. That's another fact that I've dealt with. I've said that to many folks. I don't feel God, but I know one thing. He's still present because I still have a roof over my head. There are still blessings that are still coming to me to keep me afloat and to keep the hope blinking and well lit. It's like having a, if you see a stove at your house and, and you, haven't, you haven't cooked in days and you know the stove is just cold, and but you know inside that stove, it's a gas stove pilot is lit there's a fire still in there that hope never dies as a Christian I want you to I want you to understand this when dealing with hopelessness I want to tell you something that's very comforting that hope never dies that fire is going nowhere it's not gonna blow out it's not gonna you have just listened to you in HD your identity in Jesus Christ with Pastor Eric Miller. This ministry is made possible by your thoughtful prayers and donations. Join us each week as we continue to explore our Christian identity in Jesus Christ. May God richly bless you. In Jesus' name, amen. Welcome to You in HD, your identity in higher definition with Pastor Eric Miller. Join us in our journey of faith in God by taking an in-depth look into the Bible's authority and sufficiency to guide us in our Christian walk. Discover your identity in Jesus Christ today. A blink out. You can't douse no water on it to quench it. It is the Holy Spirit keeping that, that fire lit. The only difference is we got to start lighting, light, lighting them burners. That's it. And thankfully, we're doing that today. I hope that we're doing that today. I'm telling you, I feel that burning. But it only works if I consistently keep doing it. This is the most critical part of, dep- of battling depression. Are you going to continually fight by going to his word? Are you continually going to keep going back to his word when things are rough? When, when, you, when, when this sermon ends and you don't replay it, or when you put that Bible down and turn that TV on, will you go back to that Bible because you want to be restored? Or are you going to give in again to that pain? And I'm going to tell you, it's going to be tough to go to his word and not feel guilt ridden. You know, it's, it's, it's one thing to feel empowered sitting in church when, when the preacher's telling you, you know, what you what you can do to overcome these situations and you overcome those situations and you feel strong and you feel complete and you feel like you can tackle this thing now head on and you run out the door and you get home and that depression's waiting on you. Them critical points, you need to feed your spirit. And that's lessons that I have to I have to take and listen to myself. Don't think I'm telling you this and I'm absolved. I'm learning more from me saying this sermon by God teaching me as I'm preaching it to you. We go together, brothers and sisters. My beloved, if this podcast hasn't showed you by now, we go together. There is no, I'm teaching you this and this is for somebody out there. This is for me and this is for you. I do this as my charge as to preach. And I dropped the ball. I went weeks without saying anything. I told you I would not leave and I left. And and y'all have still prayed for me and kept me relevant. Relevant in y'all's minds and in your hearts. And I ain't going to forget that. But I did. Because I've let depression override those things that have been given to me. You, this ministry, this truth. There's no reason to preach God if I'm trying to find some gain from it. I preach God because... It has been given to me as a gift. And I love him and I want to serve his will. 
And depression can sometimes rob you of that want and desire. But we got to fight together, brothers and sisters. I don't know how many times I've employed for, to hear from you and to talk to you. But this is why, so we can stay together. If I don't reach anybody from this broadcast, and anybody, if, if I reach one person that says, Eric, I'll stand with you. I'm going through the same thing. We'll go together. Then let's do it. I don't want you to feel alone like I felt. I don't want you to feel like though you're surrounded in, 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 a, in, a, in a crowded room with people of loved ones, but yet still feel alone. I don't want you to feel that way. You got me. More importantly, you got God. And if you don't have a connection to God as, as you would like, and you have some doubts and some questions, then you reach out to me. You reach out to that Christian that God has placed in your life that has a warm sense of love for you versus a quote-unquote duty feel. You know them. Those that give you the their, their speech, all depression will pass, this too shall pass, and give you no tools to work with. That ain't the person I'm talking about. I'm talking about the person that God has placed in your life that may not have the perfect words to say, but they stand with you through your storm. They are just as wet as you are. They brought an umbrella, but it got holes in it. So guess what? They still getting wet with you, but they're standing with you. We go together. We go together. Some things to understand about depression. And I think I, I, I highlighted on that, but I just want to show you that it's not alien to those in the to those in the Bible either. It ain't just us. It ain't just us after Christ, before Christ, during Christ, after Christ. Depression is part of human nature. Is part of the fallen human nature. Just some questions. Some so depression can manifest itself through external circumstances. Here's First Corinthians. I'm sorry, Second Corinthians. Chapter 1, verse 8, for we don't want you to be unaware, brothers, of our affliction that took place in Asia. We were completely overwhelmed beyond our strength so that we were even in despair of life. That's Paul. That's depression, despair of life. 1 Kings 19, 3 through 8, Elijah became afraid and immediately ran for his life. When he came to Bathsheba that belonged to Judah, he left his servant there, but he went on a day's journey into the wilderness. He sat down under a broom and prayed that he might die. He said, I've had enough, Lord. Take my life, for I'm no better than my father's. I'm going to stay at it there. And he slept all day under that broom tree. Hey, that's Elijah. Job 9.23, when disaster brings sudden death, he mocks the despair of the innocent. Isn't that terrible? Psalms 42, as deer longs for streams of water, so I long for you, God. I thirst for God, the living God. When I when can I come and appear before you, God? My tears have become have become have been my food for the day and night. First of all, I remember this as I pour out my heart, how I walked with many, leading the festive procession to the house of God with joyful and thankful shouts. This is David. So verse five, why am I so depressed? Why does turmoil more within me? Put your hope in God, for I will still praise him, my Savior and my God. Verse 6, I am deeply depressed. Therefore, I remember you from the land of Jordan. That's David. Man, that's David. Talking about depression. Isaiah 38, 1, 2. In those days, Hezekiah became terminally ill. The prophet Isaiah, son of Amos, came and said to him, This is what the Lord says, Put your affairs in order. For you're about to die, you will not recover. Then Hezekiah turned his face and wall and prayed to the Lord. He said, please, Lord, remember how I have walked before you faithfully, wholeheartedly, and have done what pleases you. And Hezekiah wept bitterly. Bitterly, wept bitterly. He got delivered some bad news and he started to crash. Isn't that, isn't that amazing? That's, that's, I mean, it, it, Jonah, the sailor, verse 5, uh, chapter 1, verse Verse 5, the sailors were afraid and, re and each cried out to his God. They threw the ship's cargo in, in the sea to light the load. Meanwhile, Jonah had gone down to the lowest parts of the vessel, stretched out and fallen deep in a deep, deep sleep. Depression. Fears of, that was under physical illness and exhaustion and, and external circumstances. 
Fear of others, fear of failure, 1 Kings 19.4, we, we read that, but he went on today's journey into the wilderness, he sat down under a broom tree and prayed that he might die, he said, I've had enough Lord, my life, uh, uh, take my life, for I'm no better than my father's. I mean, that, this is truthful stuff that's going on, serious sin, Verse 20, uh, Matthew chapter 27. Verse 3, then Judas, his betrayer, seeing that he'd been condemned, was full of remorse <coughs> and returned the 30 pieces of silver to the chief priests and elders. I have sinned by betraying innocent blood. He said, what that to us, they said, see to it yourself. And he threw the silver into the sanctuary and departed. Then he went and hanged himself. Is that not, that's depression. Judas realized against serious sin. Serious sin can cause depression. Now that's causing of depression. What did he do? He acted on something and acted it within sin. Symptoms of depression. A loathing of life and desire. We went across that. Deep, deep sorrow. Genesis 21. Chapter, uh, uh, ver let's read it, verse 16. And she went and sat down nearby about a bow shot away. For she said, I can't bear to watch the boy die. So she sat there nearby. She wept loudly. God heard the voice of the boy. And the angel of God called to Hagar from heaven and said to her, What's wrong, Hagar? Don't be afraid. For God has heard the voice of the boy from the place where he is. Get up. Help the boy up and support him. For I will make him a great nation. Hagar, weeping. Hagar weeping in deep depression. Futility of life. A sense of futility of life. Ecclesiastes verse, uh, chapter 2. Therefore I hated life because the work that was done under the sun was distressing to me for everything is futile in pursuit of the wind. That's a sense of futile in life. And this is just idea. I just want you to understand. I'm not trying to beat you down or, or, or run you back down after giving you such good news about how God's word can restore. But I want to show you that depression is a natural state of a fallen human being. But there's nothing God can't restore. Nothing that God can't restore. You understand that? Verse Psalms 23.3. I'll close this out with Psalm 23.3. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Psalm 51.12. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and uphold me with a willing spirit. Amos 9.14. I will restore the fortunes of my people Israel and they shall rebuild the ruined cities and inhabit them. They shall plant vineyards and drink their wine and they shall make gardens and eat their fruit. 2 Corinthians 13, 9, for we are glad when we are weak and you are strong. Your restoration is what we pray for. 2 Corinthians 3, 13, 11, 13, 11, finally, brothers, rejoice. Aim for restoration. Comfort one another. Agree with one another. Live in peace and the God of love and peace will be with you. That is a, ooh, that's a mountain of joy right there. That's, that got some tears in my eyes right now. 2 Corinthians 13, 11. Finally, brothers, rejoice. Aim for restoration. Look for it. Grasp for it. Comfort one another. Agree with one another. Live in peace and the God of love and peace will be with you. Galatians 6 1 brothers if anyone is caught in any transgression you are spirit you who are spiritual should restore him in spirit of gentleness keep watch on yourself lest you be tempted isn't that a beautiful feeling to have <coughs> and the Bible is ripe full of these nuggets of great truths to help you steal your, 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 your ship toward God We've been in this battle for quite a while, me and you. And, and it hasn't changed anything. We're still fighting the battles against our fallen sinful state, even though we are perfect in God. But our souls need to be constantly reminded we can't unplug from God on any, we can't take any chances. If there's any, here's, here's some added extra to add to, to, to help combat depression, feeling of hopelessness. Anything that causes you to divide yourself from God should be cut off and cut out. 
Anything that causes you to be distracted from God should be left behind, cut out, and cast away. If anything holds more importance than God, cast it out, push it aside, it's not helping you. Hopelessness can only be distracted, but it can't be cured except by Christ. Hopelessness. The world can't feed you who are in Christ. It has no ability. It has no power. It has no say in helping restore you in balance. Only you who are in Christ can only be restored and placed back in balance by Christ in God himself. You hear me? That's all we have. There is no substitution for Jesus Christ. You who are in Christ. And I plead if you are not. And you have questions on your salvation. Make today be the day that you start asking. Is Christ, has Christ been knocking on my door? And why am I ignoring it? Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I praise you in your name for giving me utterance and giving me words and giving me power to speak. For I I had none of these things, Lord, until you sent my father and sent the angels that have surrounded me and have loved me and has protected me and prayed for me to restore my voice. I thank you, Lord, for giving such a, a servant of myself that's not worthy of any of the things that you've given me. And things, the opportunities and blessings I have squandered away from, from distraction and my, and my own flesh that is weak. I ask you to forgive me, Lord, and restore me back to where you want me to be. As I stand here, Lord, and as my brothers and sisters that hear my voice today, our storm may be great and heavy. But we know that you are resting with us, steering the boat to get us through. Lord, I just ask you to give us courage to steer into the storm than trying to turn away from it as it chases us and overcomes us with its water. Lord, I ask that you help steer the boat into the storm so that we can reach the center and then go on to pass outside of it, Lord. But we can only do this with you. Lord, I ask anybody listening today, including myself, to restore our minds, forgive us of our sins and our trespasses against you and others, as we forgive those that we have, that have trespassed against us and has harmed us. Thank you for restoring us, Lord. Thank you for giving us dreams that, 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 that gives us faith and hope in you, Lord. Thank you for nudging us constantly and never giving up on us when we've given up on ourselves and our flesh. In Jesus' precious name, amen. Brothers and sisters, I thank you for listening. Thank you for praying for me. Thank you for keeping me. Um, This is a two-part series, so hopefully you can hear back-to-back and get the message that I'm trying to relay. Um, And only by the power of God and Jesus Christ am I able to tell you anything and make sense of it. Um, And and, and learn together as as I'm speaking to you. We learn from each other. I learn from your emails. I learn from your phone calls. And I learn to grow every day with you. And we grow together. This is a church family more than anything else. It's not just a ministry you listen to on your favorite medium or social media of some sort or through podcasts. This is also a church family. And I hope that you feel loved and I hope you feel appreciated by me. And if I haven't, then let me extend myself to you and say you can reach me anytime through my Facebook page. Uh, forward slash uh, UNHD. You can see it down in the, in, in, in the description of this episode. And I hope that you understand that I love you very dearly. And, and, and the love that you have for Christ that you have displayed by holding me up in prayer is not forgotten by me. In Jesus' name, I love you so much. Hope to hear from you soon. In Jesus' name, amen. You have just listened to You in HD. Your identity in Jesus Christ with Pastor Eric Miller. This ministry is made possible by your thoughtful prayers and donations. Join us each week as we continue to explore our Christian identity in Jesus Christ. May God richly bless you. In Jesus' name, amen. You have just listened to You in HD, your identity in Jesus Christ with Pastor Eric Miller. This ministry is made possible by your thoughtful prayers and donations. 
Join us each week as we continue to explore our Christian identity in Jesus Christ. May God richly bless you. In Jesus' name, amen.